Hi, I'm Randy Cross, and welcome to the Randy Cross Podcast, Season 5, Episode 15. Our guest uh, this week is Amy Trask, former CEO of the Oakland Raiders, LA Raiders, and then the Oakland Raiders again. Um, interesting woman, uh, was voted one of the top 100 influencers uh, for the 100th anniversary of the NFL. Uh, she had a heck of a heck of an imprint on the game, and she's now currently one of my one of my co cohorts at CBS Sports, working. Uh, for CBS Sports. She's on uh, the other pregame show and does a little work on the NFL today uh, on time to t- from time to time. She's also the CEO of the Big Three. Yeah, the Big Three, like the Basketball League, LL Cool J, those guys. She's the CEO of all that. I uh, want to remind you, uh, please, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. Go ahead and like us. It does matter. Same thing on YouTube. Um, on Twitter or Instagram or the rest of them, um, spread it around. If you liked it, tell your friends. If you really liked it, send it to them. All right? Well, thanks. Let's get this thing going, and we're going to start off with Amy Trask. Well, as promised now, I'm joined by Amy Trask. Uh, Amy, former CEO of the Raiders, I would say L.A. Raiders, Oakland Invaders, L.A. Raiders, but the Raiders. There's only one Raiders in my mind, and that's the Oakland Raiders, but that's just me. I know they're currently in Las Vegas. Uh, And she's now uh, the chairman of the board of the Big Three, the Basketball League, former uh, CEO of that, and works a co-worker with me at CBS Sports. She's on the other pregame show and occasionally does a little dabbling on one of my old shows, the NFL Today. Amy, welcome. Well, thank you for ha- having me, Randy. It's a pleasure to join you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, it's good to have you on this week. I, I was thinking of you the other day when all this stuff started coming out and the coaches' photos and whatnot of those spring league meetings um, down at the Breakers. Uh, what are some of your memories of those gatherings? What were those things like? I mean, it, it's... From the outside looking in, it's like, how much do you really have to do? <laughs> right. Especially since we've learned over these last couple of years how much we can do without being together. Uh, you know, question, how many of these meetings do you really need to have? There's one meeting a year. It is this spring meeting uh, at which clubs bring multiple, multiple employees. Ownership is, you know, traditionally team ownership is president is present. Uh, club executives, coaches, and you really do bring a whole group from each club. And in my years in the league, this was the one meeting a year people would bring with them spouses or significant others. Some people would bring with them children. So it is the spring meeting that's really a gathering and, and a social event as much as a meeting. Although I do understand that's waned a bit but I'm smiling at the thought of this meeting in Palm Beach because I remember during my career, one meeting at the Breakers in particular, it was a spring meeting. My husband and I got in early. The meetings hadn't started yet. I had a free morning. So we rented bicycles and we were going to take a, you know, take our bikes around the whole area. The first thing I do is oversteer the bike and crash into the set of NFL Network while they were live on air. And I just remember careening into the set and looking at the faces of everyone who is currently on air live on the NFL Network from the breakers, watching their faces thinking, oh my gosh, she's gonna careen past those cameras and she's gonna run right into the desk. But I didn't, I never ever ever made it on camera as I careened through the whole area. I then turned the bike and promptly hit a lamp post, which I then (laughs) turned and looked at my husband like, this is your fault. This is all your fault. And he looks at me like, why is it my fault that you just ran your bike into a lamp post? So that's one of my memories from the meetings at the Breakers. I could be in a meeting. I could be having brunch. But no, I'm on a bike running into people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have seen the faces of the people who were live on NFL Network when they saw me start to careen right into their big table they had set up. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, what would you think of the overtime rule getting tweaked? Isn't that something that 
I mean, to no one's real surprise, the way things came out in the playoffs in that Buffalo-Kansas City game, they actually are going to do the earth-shaking thing of giving each team a possession. It's probably, the only thing more mind-numbing is the fact that they probably had to talk about it for about three hours before they did it. Well, I'm certainly not surprised they did it. And if you hear me giggling, it's because, boy, oh, boy, do you have those meetings just down to a T, the mind-numbing discussions that occasionally go on where they don't need to go on as long as they do. I, I remember one league meeting um, in particular, stum, you know, someone stood up and said, you know, I have nothing to add to this discussion. And then he went on for 20 minutes. And this was not <laughs> at a spring meeting. You know, the spring meeting is the large meeting where teams bring a whole group and spouses and significant others. All, All right. the other meetings are either one per club or two per club. And this was at a one or two per club. And I just remember the moment he says, I have nothing to add. And 20 minutes later, this team owner is still talking. And I'm thinking, dude, you just said you had nothing to add and you're still talking. Um, but with that aside, as to the overtime rule, I'm not surprised it was changed. You know, I'm not a hot take girl anyway. I don't do hot takes. But even if I did do hot takes, I don't have one on overtime. Look, I grew up in the league um, when it was sudden death. And I'm okay with sudden death overtime. Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm one of those that scream, you don't want to lose, play defense. Um, and I know that is not a popular view this day. And I also know, um, and NFL studies show, most fans like offense. I like defense. I'd rather watch a game that was 9-7 than a game that was 40-37. to 37. I just love defense. So I'm okay with sudden death. I'm certainly okay with the change they made. I just don't have a hot take on overtime with one exception. I don't like that there's a difference between the regular season and the postseason. And I understand why that's the case. They want to limit the time of regular season games. But it just seems to me there should be one rule for the regular season and the postseason. Yeah. No, I'm with you 100% on all of that. It's, uh, it's always been crazy to me that there weren't more boisterous I guess, um, arguments being made for the win it in the first 60 minutes instead of all that extra time afterwards, that if you complain about it, then, you know, score another touchdown in the first quarter. You don't have to worry about it in overtime. Um, well, if you go to overtime and the opponent gets the ball, stop them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Stop them. Hey, were you with the Raiders uh, when the late, when the spring meeting was in Orlando, the infamous Jerry and uh, Jimmy? meeting uh yes i was are you talking about, I, I i don't want to say too much on air i don't want to yeah. get you in trouble yeah. you're talking about the one the, the infamous um encounter that wasn't during the meeting but was in the evening after the meeting yeah yeah some of the yeah the post celebrations yeah. yes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i was i, I was, was there. i was actually sitting in the sitting in the lobby that night having having a beer and looked up and all of a sudden there were these this crowd of people kind of moving towards the door. I was like, what in the heck is that? And I went back to talking back and forth. And I'm not, I'm obviously not a journalist because my curiosity wasn't that PQ'd. But I get up a little while later and I said, what was that over there? Somebody says, ah, it was some of the Cowboys people having a little beef. <laughs> Turned out to be a hell yeah, of a beef. Were yeah, there were um, there were definitely some moments at league meetings. Um, I remember really early in my career, um, and I'm going to try to do this without swearing because I don't want to swear on your podcast. Uh, but at at one point, one person from a team stood up and said, um, "You sir are alarmingly disingenuous to someone from another team," and someone next to me turned and asked me to explain is is that the same thing as calling him an effing liar and i then started <laughs> to explain well you know if he said disingenuous that would be like a liar but you know alarmingly disingenuous is more like an effing liar and i'm going on and on and on about what the difference is between calling someone disingenuous and calling someone alarmingly disingenuous and al just pokes me in the back and says he didn't ask for an effing grammar lesson. It was just great. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like your old boss. That sounds yeah. like your old boss. Um, 
you know, he was he was an amazing man. I, I know when I first left the league and started doing TV, um, I was with CBS for like five years, and then I went with NBC. And when I when I started doing the games with NBC, I think that was right about the time I met you, um, when you first started with the Raiders. And that's back in the days where I'd go to a practice with the Raiders, and I'd look up, and there's Bill standing there talking to Al. And to me, it was such an incongruous thing. I mean, I was like Raiders, Niners, that just doesn't happen. But they went back so far. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and you talk about two guys with impact on the league, besides football. I mean, football was, their, their football impact is indisputable. But their, their impact on stuff, whether it was the minority hiring, you know, with, with Tom Flores and Art Shell and, you know, hiring a woman like you and all the stuff that Bill did, they were light years ahead of the rest of the league. They, they were. And I'm so glad you raised Bill because I have such, such special memories um, from time spent during my career with Bill and Al. So Bill and Al sitting there talking X's and O's. And I was sitting there with them and, you know, I was in there to discuss business issues and, and we were discussing football issues. And just to sit there and listen to Al and Bill talk about roster strategy, team strategy, X's and O's strategy, you know, I, and they answered every question I had, Randy. You know, I would butt in with a question and and Bill would encourage me and, and they would they so patiently answered every question I had. And I remember one discussion in particular that just, it was a moment when Bill was talking to Al about roster composition. And he was very passionately and, and kindly, and it was just a wonderful tone of voice on both of their parts and a, a very philosophical discussion about players. And Bill said, Al, you keep players too long. You keep them a year or two or more longer than you should. You need to let players go earlier than you do. And Al just looked at Bill and in a very quiet voice said, I can't. I love them. And it was just such a moment. I mean, Bill was sharing his, you know, he was being so sincere and so, you know, he was looking to help Al. He was not arguing with Al. He was not criticizing with Al. He was sharing with Al his view as to what was best to build a team. And Al just listened to every word he said and was, in essence, acknowledging that Bill might write, you know, could well be, was right with respect to roster building. But he just said, I can't. I love them. And it was just a moment that will always stick with me. Yeah. And his love of the players obviously goes past the field because, you know, I mean, how many cases, you probably can't even count them, did Al help former players and their families and things a like that, that that you never heard a thing about? Randy, I know them personally because I was often the one signing the check. So, you know, he helped in other ways. I mean, it wasn't simply monetary. And, you know, I knew about those because I was processing them and handling them. But I also knew about the ways he did it where, you know, a player in ill health who couldn't get into a certain hospital where they had an expert, Al would pick up the phone and he'd make call after call after call and do what Ever he had to do to help a player. And sometimes it wasn't the player who needed the medical attention. It was a wife. It was a child. It was a parent. And I, you know, you know this, I know this, not everybody knows this, but he did so many of those things um, that people just don't know about because that was his style. And, you know, you talk about his love for the players. Uh, I can hear it in his voice right now as we're talking. He told me, so many times throughout my career, over and over and over again, the players are the game. And he really believed that the players are the game. You know, I, I got in a conversation a couple of weeks ago. I was doing another podcast and they were asking me about kind of the sports titans. You know, the not the ones in Nashville, just the, the bigger than life, <laughs> the, Mount Ru- the Mount Rushmore types. Um, and the argument from the other side was, how come we don't have those titans right now? 
You, you look around the league, you look around pro sports, there just aren't that many people um, that you would qualify in that, in that category. And I, I, would, I didn't argue with them, but I basically I said, well, should you? I mean, are you supposed to have X amount of Titans, X amount of, you know, just giants of the game? That, I don't think that's kind of how it works. That's why those people are so unusual, and that's why they stick out so, so much, and that's why you miss them so poorly, so, so greatly, I should say. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very intriguing question, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, Al and Bill, the two we were just discussing, their backgrounds were football. You know, Al was a football coach before he ultimately became the owner of, of a team. Um, you know, with the values of franchises now, um, that's hard to imagine that happening again unless it's someone who inherits a team um, from his or from her family. So, you know, there could be someone who goes into coaching or a background with X's and O's and then ultimately becomes the primary owner because he or she inherits it from a family member. Um, but other than that, it's hard to imagine someone coming from a football background to become a team owner. Yeah, that, that whole conversation was born out of uh, Paul Brown and kind of the Paul Brown, Bill Walsh ah. connection. You know, going back to when he didn't hire him yeah. and he hired Tiger Johnson and blah, blah, blah. And Bill went away for a little while and then went to Stanford. And um, but, yeah, I, I, I just found I found it kind of an interesting subject personally, because I look around. And I said, well, if you want to tighten a giant of the game, I'd start with Bill Belichick. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I agree. I'd, I'd say you've got a guy in Robert Kraft that's won a pretty amazing amount of what he's done. Um you know, and there's other people out there that would somewhat qualify, but I don't know. It's it, it's something that uh, is one of those, like I've, the the term I use, which is one of my least favorite sports radio um, conversations, the Mount Rushmore guys. Everybody, you wants, know what? I hate that want, term as well. Everybody <laughs> wants to. Is he on the Mount Rushmore? I said, well, it, it ain't. Let's start with the fact it just ain't that big. Yeah, I, I've, I've never liked the whole Mount Rushmore concept either. And why do we have to limit it to four? And it's not the same as Mount Rushmore. I've just never liked that either. And I don't know exactly why. But I'll tell you, if there was one, and if you want to talk about Bill Belichick, you know, I will tell you, I think he's the best coach all time ever. And when I say that, people say to me immediately, well, you know, what about, you know, Vince Lombardi? What about what, 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 what about? Um, you know, all the great coaches that came before, and I include Bill Walsh in this, um, weren't operating at a time with the current collective bargaining and free agency, what it is, you know, it, free agency as it is now and the salary cap as it is now. In other words, there have been other terrific coaches, of course, of course, but they weren't operating under all of those um, sort of regulations. I think Bill Belichick is the best coach of all of all time. Um, and people, you know, kind of raise an eyebrow when I say that, given the history between the Raiders and New England. But, you know, look, Robert Kraft, Jonathan Kraft, um, they care, of course, deeply about their team, the Patriots, but they also care deeply about the National Football League. And there have been many things that Robert Kraft has done, that Jonathan Kraft has done, that people aren't aware of. Um, in which they've put what they in, in which they've put their um, care for the league and their concern for the league ahead of their individual concern and their individual I guess the interests of the league mm -hmm. ahead of their personal interests and um, I think it's a very special organization. I still think it was a fumble, but that's a different yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the studio trying to explain the tuck rule that night uh, for the NFL today, as a matter of fact. Um, and, and you, I am, ever, I am very confident that when you did that on air, you did that with far more graceful language than I did it in the stadium, in that press box where the visiting team people were sitting. I, could, I, lay, I was able to later <laughs> repeat it in front of my family, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I did repeat it in front of my family, but that doesn't mean it was nice language. <laughs> uh, two quick questions before you, before you go. One, why is it so elusive to have continuity in the NFL? And I don't mean just players with free agency, but coaches, front offices. It, it seems like we are at a rate right now in football that poaching is it's incredible no one it's like original thoughts have gone by the wayside if you can't beat somebody hire their ideas 
think it's several fold. I think one, um, you can fire a coach or fire an executive without a salary cap implication, without accelerating money, without dead money. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you're not going to be paying them even when you've fired them. When you terminate people, there's instances in which you owe them a lot of money, but there's no salary cap considerations, dead money considerations. So, you know, team owners that are looking to make a change or GMs or CEOs that are looking to make a change can do that with less consequence than making a change with, let's say, a quarterback sometimes. And number two, I think it's also societal in nature. People don't have a lot of patience. You know, it's what have you done now? What have you done in the last few years? There's not a lot of team owners with a tremendous amount of patience. One, I think, um, and he there was just an extension announced for John Harbaugh, is Steve Bashotti. Mm-hmm. And he's the antithesis of hurry, hurry, make a change every two years, make a change every three years. Uh, and I think he's doing the right thing by sticking with John. I love that he is and he's been patient. But you're right. That's not the norm. And I don't think that's limited to the National Football League. I think that's, you know, sort of where we are today as a society. Everything's week to week to week to week. And, you know, something that's huge news today, people aren't talking about in a few weeks. All right. And that kind of leads dovetails into my second and last question. Um, it's sort of the influence of social media to an extent. Not to criticize something we're both very active in, um, but for instance, my old team, Jimmy Garoppolo, he's taken them to a Super Bowl. He's taken them to a couple NFC Championship games. He played last year with a fractured thumb and a tore up shoulder, both you know, both of which are getting repaired in the off season. Um, and he was deemed good enough and clearly a starter. Why do you suddenly just sort of, as a group, and that that 49er fandom has just kind of freaked me out the last few months watching this going on, going, where are you people going? I mean, I understand they like Trey Lance and the potential, and they gave up a lot for Trey Lance. But if he was good enough to start in a conference championship game a couple months ago, would it be impossible to think that he could still be good enough to be a starter for that team? Well, I think he can be a starter for any number of teams, um, including the 49ers. I don't know how how good Trey, Lan- Trey will ultimately be or not. Maybe he'll be terrific. Maybe he'll be spectacular. Maybe he won't live up to ex- expectations. My view on Jimmy has always been he's a good quarterback. Mm-hmm. He's not a spectacular, you know, get him at any price quarterback. He's not the guy that if I need to turn to someone and say, put this entire team on your shoulders and find a way to win, carry this whole team with you, find a way to get it done. You know, he's not an Aaron Rodgers or a Peyton Manning or a John Elway. I could go on and on and on, but is he a good quarterback? Yes, he is. He did all the things you just named. He's taken his team further than many quarterbacks have taken their teams. Of course, he's had some tremendous, tremendous players around him and a good coach. Um, So I think he's a good quarterback. I don't think he is the guy I want to turn to in a pinch and say, find a way to get this done. Go in there. Do it. But you don't know yet if that's going to be Trey either. The thing I will say about Jimmy that I found the most impressive last year was the manner in which he embraced a new rookie quarterback who had clearly been drafted to replace him. He did everything he could to help Trey learn and grow, and I have tremendous respect for that. He was a teammate, and he was a leader. That's great. And, and be honest, as a quarterback, if you had to pick one guy to be the first guy down the runway modeling clothes, it'd be Jimmy. No, see, I'm just, you know what? I, this is going to be something I'll, you know, get clobbered for. Not my taste. It's just, no, it's, yeah, no. 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 I, I understand. I understand a lot of people have said that about him. I understand that's the popular view. That's just not my taste. (laughs) I love you. You're the best, Amy. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for having me. It was a real treat. I appreciate it a lot. Okay. Bye-bye now. So what do you think? Pretty impressive lady, huh? Amy's, uh, she's really something. 
She's really something. I'm proud to call her a friend. She's uh, got a great sense of humor uh, and uh, is a heck of an attorney because anybody that can be around Al Davis for that long and be an attorney, you better be that good because Al knew how to use those guys. Uh, okay, uh, let's go right now to the feel-good story of the week. And this is going to be something, um, you know, usually it's the dogs, you go the whole dodo thing or the animals. This isn't. This is really different. It's going to start out kind of like, hey, where's this going? But trust me, this is a feel-good story you're going to really enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate you. Enjoy, have a good right huh yeah that's a that's a heck of a story the uh, I don't know see kids like that just see kids in general there's so much in the news and a lot of the things we see from time to time these days about pedophile pedophiles and pedophilia and I mean anybody that could actually do harm of any kind to a kid they've got a reserved seat in an extra hot section of hell and that's for them after we get done with them when they leave here. But it's not, uh, not a good thing. And hopefully it's something people can get behind and you pay more attention to it because there's a hell of a lot more of it going on around there than you really realize. All right. Social media wise, how'd you find this? Well, we always say the best thing to do is to go to randycross.com. That's where you find this, this podcast. Um, go to Twitter, go to Facebook, go to all the regular sites, or like I said, also go to YouTube and also randycross.com and, uh, get your, get your Randy Cross podcast on there. All right. Let's end this thing the same way we always end it here at the Randy Cross podcast. And that's with a little bit of happy trails. Enjoy your week.